The National School Board Association is backing down from its assertion that parents concerned about critical race theory in their children's schools are akin to domestic terrorists. So does that mean the U.S. Department of Justice and the FBI are going to apologize for going along with the charade? Not according to Attorney General Merrick Garland. Friends, it is time for Hold the Line. Welcome to Hold the Line, I'm Buck Sexton. The parent insurrection of 2021. That's what we were supposed to think was going on because there were parents who were showing up to say, hey, I don't like that my children are being taught critical race theory in school, which tells them that they are either an oppressor or oppressed because of their skin color, or that they don't agree with a transgender bathroom use policy, or perhaps they didn't like the mask mandates. Parents have been showing up to these meetings on a number of fronts, stretching back for months now, the school board meetings, and this has gotten a lot of national attention. Most notably recently, the Attorney General's Office of Merrick Garland for the Department of Justice put out this memo that was spurred by the NSBA, the National School Board Association, that said that parents were a threat and were domestic terrorists. The NSBA has apologize for this now after all the backlash. On behalf of the NSBA, we regret and apologize for the letter. There was no justification for some of the language included in the letter. We should have had a better process in place to allow for consultation on a communication of this significance. Yep. Turns out that when you call parents domestic terrorists because they just want the best for their children and they have committed no acts of terror unless you consider hurting the feelings of a bunch of worthless education bureaucrats and some other folks sitting on the school board to be a terror act, yeah, this was an outrage. And that was certainly the tone that you had today up on Capitol Hill with Republicans who were making very clear just how angry they were about all this, how uh, deeply upset they are with this politicized Attorney General Merrick Garland. But Merrick Garland, he stood by the DOJ memo after getting a lot of heat today. He decided that he was going to act like it was just fine. Watch this. Presumably, you wrote the memo because of the letter. The letter is disavowed now. So you're going to keep your memo going anyway, right? Is that what you're telling me? Senator, I have the letter from NSBA that you're referring to. It apologizes for language in the letter, but it can continues its concern about the safety of school officials and school staff. Ah, indeed. Indeed. So he is just going to say this is a word game situation. This is not anything bigger than that. Sorry, that's not going to really fly, is it? But let's just look at this now. He's pretending that it was just a change in the verbiage of the letter. That's the big thing. That was the big issue. And yet... When you dive into what the letter actually claims, uh, threats of violence, I mean, that's what the Attorney General's office was referring to, impossible terror acts by parents, parents of children at their school board. We really think they're terrorists? How could someone say such a thing? Well, as you know, if you voted for Donald Trump, according to Democrats, you are de facto uh, part of the insurrection of January 6th, and so you're kind of a domestic terrorist too. And maybe a white nationalist as well, because if you supported Donald Trump January 6th, there were, this is what they always do. They include all these people in this, and they lie, and they smear. This is the game that they play. But what was really the concern then? Why did the attorney general's office put out that letter? I mean, what were the bad things that were happening? Merrick Garland was asked about it. Here's what he said. Uh, Senator, I, uh, best of my recollection, I said that the impetus for the letter um, for my memorandum was that letter and also uh, reports um, of, of this kind of activity. What reports? I said again that uh, at the time that they were news reports um, that had um, uh, been published, and I think that uh, some of the other senators here have described some of those news reports, and we've certainly seen subsequently more news reports and more statements by board members of threats to kill them. Why, why is it a federal government issue? I mean, let's start with that. First of all, it's really weak, right? He's saying, oh, there's some news report somewhere about something. But why is this a federal government issue that rises all the way up to the attorney general's office? 
Because of the politics of it, that's why. Because the teachers unions and the teaching bureaucrats of the public school system and control of the public school system, the indoctrination therein and control of school boards all the way down to the most local and, uh, and near to you and your children level, that's something Democrats need to control or else they worry about how they'll be able to keep getting elected how they'll be able to indoctrinate the youth into left-wing ideology. So where were the threats of actual violence? I mean, he was speaking about threats. Where were the violence threats? Here's the attorney general saying, well, I mean, I don't really know. When you got the letter that, from the White House that, that prompted your memorandum to give the FBI new duties and making sure our parents aren't dangerous domestic terrorists. You didn't investigate before you issued your, your memorandum the incidences cited in the letter, did you? Most of the incidents in the letter were, did not involve threats of violence, did they? I think that's correct. Most of them did not. Yeah. They did not involve threats of violence. So what are we talking about here? I mean, that's what you want to ask. How is it that the Attorney General's office puts out a memo saying they're working with local and federal law enforcement to come up with some kind of a fusion to deal with the domestic terrorist parents out there when there's been no terrorism, there's been no threats of terrorism, there have been some disputes at some school board meetings. What's going on here? Well, I think we all understand what's going on here. This was the Democrat-controlled usage of the power of the Department of Justice to try to chill speech, to try to freak people out, make parents feel like they shouldn't be speaking out. Senator Tom Cotton sees it, and man, did he hammer Garland today up on Capitol Hill. Here you go. This is shameful. This, here, this testimony, your directive, your performance is shameful. Okay. That's not Th Thank God you are not on the Supreme Court. You that should resign in disgrace, Judge. Guy hasn't been talked to like that, I bet, in a long time, maybe ever. But his performance was appalling. Uh, his performance was disingenuous. That memo never should have been put out by his office, but we live in an era where the weaponization of every apparatus of government against political opposition is something that the Democrats and the left embrace. And this is also at a moment in time where there's a particular sensitivity about this in, in Virginia when it comes to teachers, uh, I'm sorry, when it comes to school boards, rather, and what is being taught in schools. Terry McAuliffe, just next week, we'll find out who the governor of Virginia is going to be. He's the Democrat, and he's getting a lot of heat over this. He's got problems. And he's out there saying CRT isn't taught in schools. That if you think it is, you're, you must be kind of racist. But, you know, this is Junkin trying to stir up this critical race theory, which I'll be honest with you, Bill, I find highly offensive. Critical race theory is not taught in Virginia. It has never been taught. It is a racist dog whistle, and I'm really tired of it. Oh, saying that it's being taught is the racism, not the actual teaching of it, which is happening, which is why parents are so upset. But they'll just re keep redefining CRT so that there really is no such thing as CRT. It's just in your imagination. That's what they want to do. Not going to fall for it. Sorry, Terry. I think he's going to have to find a, a new thing to do after next week, hopefully, when Glenn Youngkin beats him, but it's going to be close. Coming up, the Wuhan Institute of Virology isn't the only questionable lab Anthony Fauci's National Institute of Health funded. According to a new report, the NIH also funded a lab in Tunisia that reportedly tortured and killed dozens of dogs after infecting them with parasites. It's horrific. When we come back, we'll talk to the founder and president of the White Coat Waste Project, Anthony Bellotti, whose organization broke this story. Let's change gears here for a second. Let's talk about investments. Crypto market's hot. A lot of people want to get on the action, and for the first time in many cases. Well, Bitcoin, Ethereum, so many tokens out there. How do you get started? How do you become a crypto investor? That's where my digital money comes in. It's an easy-to-use, self-trading crypto IRA platform with incredible customer service. I mean, they'll actually answer your phone calls and help you get started. Look, the crypto market's heating up. This might be the best time in a long time to get into this exciting technology-based investment. When it comes to your money, you deserve a team of dedicated professionals who have your back, speak to you honestly, and treat you like a human, not a number. Check them out at MyDigitalMoney.com. That's MyDigitalMoney.com. We'll be right back with more. Hold the line.
A nonprofit organization called the White Coat Waste Project has found that a lab in Tunisia tortured and killed dozens of dogs after infecting them with disease causing parasites. This research was funded by Dr. Anthony Fauci's NIH, which sent a $375,000 grant to the lab. According to the nonprofit, the, the money went to, quote, drugging beagles and locking their heads in mesh cages filled with hungry sandflies so that the insects could eat them alive. Joining me now is the founder and president of the White Coast Waste Project, Anthony Bellotti. Anthony, thank you for being with us. Thanks for having us on. Appreciate the opportunity. Okay, there's, there's a lot I want to ask you here, and I, I talked about this in your, your group's findings uh, on my radio show earlier this week, and I can tell you we had people from all over the United States calling in who were absolutely furious about this. As you know, Americans love their dogs. Uh, in your findings, I mean, what I, I never got, even got to see, what was the supposed rationale that this lab had for torturing dogs uh, slowly to death and removing their vocal cords so that their, their uh, screams, so to speak, could not be heard? Yeah, it, it's NIH has some explaining to do on a lot of things right now. There's been a lot of confusion in the media and, and in the stories going around about these truly horrific findings that you're talking about that have united the country. The White Coat Waste Project uh, launched the Beaglegate campaign and investigation. And what we found is it's not one lab in Tunisia. It, it's not two labs. It's not three labs. We've confirmed four separate and distinct labs funded by Fauci's NIAID for the Beagle experiments. We've been on this trail for a number of years. The first one we found was actually in his own intramural NIAD office, right in their own basement. They were doing these experiments with no pain relief and no anesthesia. Okay, that was the first one. The second one, and that was the sand, that was sandfly. He was doing sandfly biting experiments in his own Maryland NIH lab. Number one. Number two, they did the same thing they were doing there with the sandflies. And then they outsourced it to Georgia. Okay. That's the second Beagle Gate lab, taxpayer funded. All of them. The third Tunisia example, in which the NIAID funded the lab in Tunisia. Okay. Another variation on a theme. The fourth one is the infamous debarking, cutting the vocal cords out, which is in California. This is, they call it Beagle Gate for a reason. It's a widespread pattern of abuse because 50 cents on the dollar of Fauci's budget goes for animal experimentation. That's nearly $3 billion a year he's funding on these kinds of experiments. It's horrific. It's wasteful. It's wrong. And it's uniting everybody against it. What were these experiments supposed to find out? I mean, usually you see something like this animal testing that say, okay, well, before we give a vaccine to humans, we might try it on a chimpanzee and see what the reaction is. What were they doing with sand fleas, beagles? Yeah. It, it, just seems, it just seems beyond belief that something so cruel could be underway. Was there some lofty justification from these bureaucrats for this? You know, each one of them is, the answer is no, there is no lofty, I mean, excuse me, there is no good justification for it. Lofty, veneer, you know, uh, sure. It's, it's government, when have, we never, when have we ever met a government agency that doesn't like to spend money and then say, well, we need more research, let's do it again, and let's do it again, and another variation on a theme. Endless, endless experimentation to know, you know, grants that go on forever, that kind of thing. It's wasteful spending. It's, it, what's going on at the NIH and Fauci's NIAID is no different than any government bureaucracy that has a spending problem. Dr. Fauci has a wasteful spending problem. And to answer your specific question, though, look, each one of those four, four separate and distinct Beaglegate labs, they're all a little bit different. The sandfly experiments, for example, where they gnaw at the beagle's ears, you know, uh, eating them, feeding on them. They're, they're, they're investigating a, you know, a, a nasty parasitic disease that has very severe uh, real world consequences for folks and some folks, in, the, in especially in third world. But, you know. For example, he was doing it in his own lab. He was doing it in his own lab with no anesthesia or pain relief. He was doing it at taxpayer expense. When he was finished with that, then they outsourced it to Georgia to do it again. 
Okay. Georgia, the Georgia lab, the second example, they say that Fauci specifically, the NIH ID specifically demanded dogs, right? So not even some other animals, but dogs. So when he outsourced to Georgia, the Georgia guys said, well, Fauci's, Fauci's people said we wanted dogs. Tunisia, another whole story, you know, out in California, they're doing other things with the debarking. Look, it's a mess. There's a lot of labs. It's much more than just one. There's more, there's more than one sand fly biting experiment. The whole so, thing, we need to open the books and all so, this. So this, this, is, this is critical, Anthony, and we really appreciate uh, you bringing this to light. So as horrific as it is, I mean, I give people on radio a content warning before I even describe the Tunisia lab because it's really, it's really upsetting to people and it's upsetting to me, quite honestly. Uh, Three billion a year on animal testing he spends. Is there any way, because this is where you know, you know where this is going to go. Dr. Fauci, I mean, I call him frequently the little lab coat tyrant. So everyone who watches this knows I've, I'm a, I've been a huge critic of his for a long time on COVID response and other things. But on this issue, it looks like he's just going to say, oh, it's a big organization. I have a big budget. I had no idea this was. Like the, the, right. So tell just, us just like if that's, if, to tell us what, what the reality is there. That's exactly what they're going to say. They're already saying it. They're already saying it. But, you know, you do something once, it's, it's, it's an accident. You do something twice, it's a coincidence. You do something three times, it's a habit or a pattern. You do something four times, it's, you know, I mean, we're in scandal territory now. And that's just the beagles. You know, we, there's a lot, other, a lot of other waste, fraud, and animal abuse that they're funding all around the world. So, you know, $3 billion, that buys a lot of abuse. And every year after year after year, what are they going to say? Well, you know, it's the Wuhan all over again. The Wuhan lab is an animal lab. That is part of Fauci's wasteful spending. That's, we exposed the payouts there. We were the first ones to do that. And there's a reason for that. We're the animal funding guys. That's what we do. And, you know, we're a single issue organization. We don't, we don't take a position on, the, on these other issues that, you know, you, you've, you've educated folks about. You know, we're just the guys who do the find, expose, defund on animal lab spending, taxpayer. And Dr. Fauci is at the center of both of these scandals, Wuhan and BeagleGate. It's amazing because you see so many of these products out there that will always reassure people, no animal testing, right? This has actually become a a, a sales pitch because people don't want there to be, you know, cruelty against animals to see if a certain hair care product or whatever maybe works a certain way. I know that in situations perhaps they will use animal testing if they feel there's no other way to prevent putting humans at risk. But animal testing on the scale you're talking about, three billion dollars all over the world, who's oh, who's doing oversight on this? Where's the accountability? I mean, no, there is no accountability. That's how we end up with gain of function bad experiments over there. Humanized mice. I mean, who's doing? Who's watching the store? No yeah. one. Apparently, nobody was watching why have, Wuhan. Why don't we have and, four Beagle Labs? Yeah, and we're all you know, and, and, that's, and those humanized mice, bats, and beagles. That's the twenty first century paint, uh, picture of what animal experimentation looks like. You know, it's not it's not bunnies with mascara in their eyes anymore. That was the seventies, the eighties. That ain't happening in the U.S. really anymore. The government spends more than all private industry combined. And for the private industry that is doing it, the government is forcing them to do it and mandating it on them, right? Mandates. Yeah. The government spending problem is, that's why we talk about white coat waste. It's, the, it's wasteful spending and animal experimentation in the 21st century are inextricably linked. And we gotta have you back as you get more on this, because it sounds like you're just at the tip of the iceberg with it and people do need to know about this. And I can tell you, you're. Your group's uh, findings this week got a lot of attention, as I'm sure you know. So We've got we'll have you... the findings on this and Wuhan. We've got them both. Yeah. Thanks so much. Appreciate your work. We'll talk to you. You're very welcome. Thank you. We'll be right back with more Hold the Line. But first, I want to talk to you about protecting yourself from online criminals. Look, the threat of some cyber thief stealing your credit card isn't really your biggest risk online. Your massive risk is that he takes over ownership of your home. It's called home title theft. The FBI calls it one of the fastest growing crimes. Cyber criminals hack into vulnerable, vulnerable government bank or mortgage company servers where copies of your home's title is stored. Then that thief will forge your signature stating you sold your home to him. He'll borrow on your home and leave you in debt. You won't know until collection notices show up. Protect your most viable asset. Go to HomeTitleLock.com and register your address to see if you're already a victim. 
Use promo code radio for 30 free days of protection. Again, that's HomeTitleLock.com, promo code radio. We'll be right back. President Joe Biden heads to Europe on Thursday for the annual G20 summit. As usual, a common theme throughout the two-day meeting is likely how terrible America is. I mean, we'll see that, right? That kind of thinking doesn't sit well with my friend David Harsanyi, who knows America is awesome, as we do here on this show. In his new book, Euro Trash, oh my, Why America Must Reject the Failed Ideas of a Dying Continent. I don't know why they're all French all of a sudden, but Harsanyi examines the most prominent form of oikophobia, defined as the abnormal fear of home in elite American lives and the insistence that Europe is better in every way than the United States. Harsanyi is a senior writer at National Review. He joins now to discuss. David, good to see you. Always a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Buck. All right, take in from a National Review article you wrote about this topic. I want to read the following. By any genuine measurement, America is the most tolerant place on earth. This is an easy fact to forget for those who experience it. And these days, it's also an unfashionable thing to say. But the level of peaceful cooperation between people of truly diverse backgrounds, faith, and creeds, or anything even approaching it, is wholly unprecedented in human history. I mean, David, that, that's, that's not what they're telling me over at CNN and MSNBC. And I feel like those people, they, you know, ooh, they're, they're very serious journos. What's going on? Well, they're creating this conception of America that's completely wrong. I mean, all you have to do is look outside. I live in the D.C. area, and I have neighbors from all over the world. In fact, some of them are killing each other in other places, the same people, Pakistanis, Indians, whatever. Um, there's just never been anything like this in human history. It's because we assimilate immigrants. I'm not talking about illegal immigration right now, just normal uh immigration. We assimilate people really, really well here. We do have been doing it forever. Um, when you look at quantifiable numbers like uh, home ownership or unemployment or anything you want on the economic level, uh, minorities do better here than they do in any virtually any European country. I'll give you a quick fact. If you made if you if, if the United States invaded Britain and made them a state, they would be the second poorest state in the country after Mississippi per capita. And that is most European countries would be in the bottom third. Um, I don't know that people understand that here because we're always bashing, bashing the nation and pretending that we're the most intolerant place on earth. It, it is remarkable because you'll have people who think themselves very informed and sophisticated in America, about American politics and culture, day-to-day -day life, who will say things like, we, I mean, Bernie Sanders constantly referring to every industrialized country in the world or every Western European country, he'll say, has the following, all these great things. And it seems like the American left, in particular, holds up Northern Europe as a kind of utopia. What's the reality of that? Well, it's interesting, and there's a couple of layers to that. The first layer is that uh, we can't scale that kind of system to the United States. It's impossible. I mean, uh, Sweden, the largest of those Nordic countries, has, I think, 9 million people. Um, they have a massive welfare state. But the average person pays around 60 or more percent of their salary and taxation. Now, Bernie doesn't even want to do what they're doing in Denmark. He doesn't want anyone. To, he wants just rich people to pay for it. He wants to just print money. But that's not what they do there. Secondly, they have a far more capitalistic. It's a capitalist society that holds up a giant welfare state. It's not a socialistic society as he sort of uh, frames it. Um, and thirdly, I wouldn't want to live like them. I don't think they have better things than us. Um, they have the government providing things. They have a culture that's dependent on government. Now, American culture is not like that. We're entrepreneurial. We have a lot of risk taking in this culture. Um, that's how we create technology. When you look at the top 30 tech companies, there's only one from Europe. The rest are all American. I know everyone's mad at tech companies, but still, you know, it reflects our technological know-how and our innovation. We have a much more, a less class-driven society. People move from class to class. It's a meritocracy. All these things are undermined by giant welfare states, so we shouldn't want it to begin with. David, another area, I mean, you, you wrote this, in this uh, I mentioned this in the National Review excerpt that I, I read a moment ago. We talk about tolerance and uh, the way that we get along with each other. We constantly talk about racism in this country, and I have pointed out to people uh, on a pretty regular basis that when you travel to other places where I've been, particularly, in my case, the uh, Muslim world, the Middle East and South Asia, Racism takes on a whole new connotation uh, in terms of how present it is, how out in the open, how nasty it is. And in Europe, they have a lot of racism, too. And it seems like uh, when people start to look at it, 
they have this idea that everyone in Europe gets along so well and is so, is so good to each other. I mean, they obviously aren't going very far back in history for that, but that's another discussion. But even today, there's a lot of racism in Europe. There's a lot of strife. Yeah. I mean, ask the people who live in generational ghettos outside of Paris what, what racism is. I mean, maybe, maybe you know, people view racism here through dog whistles and all these sort of things. And of course, I'm not saying we're perfect. We have racists in this country. There's no doubt about it. Our history is, is imperfect. Um, but European history is imperfect, too. I mean, th there was a Holocaust in Europe not that long ago. And anti-Semitism right now in places like France and Germany is, is since as, at an all-time high since that point. Um, but, but, but Africans who live in the continental Europe and in, in the European Union in, most, in the most tangible ways do not succeed as well as, as minorities do here. Uh, under 10% of, 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 of minorities in Europe have owned their own home. Here it's over 40%. Are, are there, there's sky high unemployment for, for minorities. In Turkey, there's, there's Islamic communities that, that haven't integrated generationally, meaning they're on their third and fourth generation living there without becoming a real part of society. Those are things that actually matter, I think, far more than the kind of racism most people talk about here. And again, we're imperfect, but the idea that Europe isn't racist is nuts. And you can even ask exchange students from the United States who go there. They're always, there's so many testimonials, I have them in my book, of, of you know, African Americans going to Europe and realizing that people can be racist in any of those nations and usually are more than even here. Why do you think it is so common, I would even say fashionable, among Democrats to just dump all over America all the time? What, what is that? Listen, I don't know exactly why. Some of it, like with Bernie, is that he's a he's a yeah, he's a communist, basically. I mean, you know, whatever you want to call it, he was a Trotskyite. To him, it's an ideological, religious kind of view of America that we we are the you know all sin is born here. But for others, I just think that when you're trying to sell this welfare state, this dependency state, the only way you can really do it is to say, "Wow, things are terrible here. We need the government to save us in every you know instant." And I think that that's uh, obviously that is just undermines uh, self-sufficiency. It undermines the dynamism of America in many ways. Um, it undermines the entrepreneurial spirit I was just talking about in many ways. And uh, it, it, it's un-American to say, hey, the state will help us. It also elbows out us helping each other. Americans give seven times as much per capita of charity than a European because we care about our local communities more and we don't rely on the state. And all these things are what, are what make America unique and the things that they, in fact, people like Bernie want us, you know, end. The book is Euro Trash. Go get yourself a copy of it, folks. The author is David Harsanyi. David, congrats. Thanks for being with us. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Russian and Chinese warships held their first joint patrol in the Western Pacific Ocean this week, marking a new era of cooperation between two of America's most dangerous antagonists. When we come back, senior research fellow at the Heritage Foundation, Dean Chang, explains the danger of the Far East team-up possibility here to America's interests in the region. I want to tell you one more time about my friends at My Digital Money. Crypto is heating up. Bitcoin, Ethereum, dozens of digital tokens. But how do you get started? Well, that's where you get My Digital Money coming into the picture. It's an easy-to-use, self-trading crypto IRA platform with incredible customer service. It's one of the few U.S.-based crypto companies that will answer your phone call and help you get started. They offer an unparalleled military-grade security for your coins. And when it comes to your money, you deserve a team of dedicated professionals who have your back, speak to you honestly, and treat you like a human, not a number. Check them out at MyDigitalMoney.com. That's MyDigitalMoney.com. We'll be right back. The Russian and Chinese navies held their first joint patrol in the Western Pacific Ocean this week with 10 warships, five from each country, uh, completing a near circle around Japan's main island of Honshu. According to the Russian Defense Ministry, the objective of a joint patrol was to, quote, demonstrate the state flags of Russia and China, maintain peace and stability in the Asia-Pacific region, and also protect facilities of both countries' maritime economic activity. So what should we make of this troubling show of unity between two of America's leading antagonists on the world stage? Dean Chang is a senior research fellow at the Heritage Foundation. He joins us now. Dean, good to see you again. Thanks for having me again. All right, let's, let's start with the basics here. A lot of people watching will probably be hearing about this for the first time. It hasn't gotten a ton of media attention, but for those who are national security watchers and concerned about the rise of China in, well, recent years and recent weeks too, 
Uh, tell us, what were the basics here? I mean, what was this joint naval patrol all about? And why was it the first time? So what we saw, and uh, if you take a close look at the clip, you'll see some of the most modern warships in both the Russian and Chinese navies, uh, basically um, sailing through international waters, uh, which is the uh, straits uh, separating some of the Japanese home islands. Uh, this is part of a larger, uh, broader set of things. We've watched the Chinese and Russians do joint air patrols. They've gone into the Japanese and South Korean air defense identification zones together. They've held ground force exercises in both Russia and now China. Uh, all of this is basically an effort on the part of both Beijing and Moscow to signal Washington, Tokyo, uh, Berlin, and elsewhere. Um, you're not facing one of us, you're facing both of us. And not with old equipment or obsolete weapons, but very modern systems. So what, what is the status really of the Russian and Chinese diplomatic and military relationship? Is there a burgeoning alliance here? Is the idea that the two of them can work together to push out into their spheres of influence more and therefore, perhaps you got NATO on the West for Russia. You've got the island chain nations, uh, you know, Japan, the Philippines, all the island chain nations uh, that have, up to this point at least, been something of a strategic box in for China. Are Russia and China going to team up? Is that a real thing? I think up until about a year ago, most people would have said that a lot of this stuff was really posturing. Sure, you wind up with a brigade of Chinese troops. Uh, quote unquote, cooperating with the Russians or vice versa. But that's not the same thing as NATO, where you have an integrated command structure and integrated you know, forces that are always operating together. But this summer, we saw something very unique. We saw Chinese and Russian troops so integrated, you're watching Russian infantry coming out of Chinese armored personnel carriers. And they were using an integrated common set of uh, command control communications and computer equipment. That's actually very impressive. So I think what we are watching is a steady uptick in the level of cooperation, which goes to the broader political point of whether or not we're allied, you, the rest of the world, need to worry about whether we're allied. And I do think that we should always be wary of the possibility that these two countries could well coordinate. So it's not that Russian bombers will strike targets that the Chinese designate, but if China went after Taiwan, would Russia take advantage of that time to go after Poland or the Baltics or Ukraine? Um, in the past, that was unlikely. Uh, now, I think we have to think of it as a very real possibility. What was the reaction from uh, leaders of nations in the region uh, and uh, particularly U.S. allies like Japan, South Korea, uh, did they feel like this was a provocation? Are, are they concerned about this Russia-Chinese uh, possible alliance? Japan is absolutely concerned. Uh, either Russia or China is going to pose an enormous threat to uh, Japan. Uh, Japan doesn't have nuclear weapons. It relies on the American alliance to provide nuclear deterrence. Um, and the Chinese in particular have been making louder and louder noises about how hostile Japan is. Uh, South Korea is a somewhat different situation. On the one hand, they have been worried about these intrusions into their air defense identification zone. But South Koreans also look at Japan as very unfriendly because of a long and very checkered history there. Um, I will note that White House Press Secretary Saki uh, said she and the Biden administration welcomes stiff competition from China. Um, that's not typically the kind of thing you hear from, from past presidents about welcoming uh, this sort of, of challenge from the Chinese. President Biden, Dean, I want to switch gears for a second here a little bit, made some comments about Taiwan and America's commitment, which is kind of not that defined, right, to defend the nation. I wanted to get your take in response to what Biden had to say here. And so I have had, I have spoken and spent more time with Xi Jinping than any other world leader has. That's why you have, you know, you hear people saying Biden wants to start a new Cold War with China. I don't want a Cold War with China. I just want to make China understand that we are not going to step back. We are not going to change any of our views. So are you China saying that, that the United States would come to Taiwan's defense if yes, China we, attacked? Yes, we have a commitment to do that. 
So when we say we have the commitment, what specifically is the commitment? And do you think the Biden administration has the backbone if pushed, if China went for it with Taiwan to maintain that commitment? This was an incredible statement, uh, frankly, a very dangerous statement. The U.S. has always had a policy of strategic ambiguity with regards to Taiwan. We don't diplomatically recognize Taiwan. Uh, We are not allied with Taiwan. We have a law, the Taiwan Relations Act, that says that we will provide Taiwan with the equipment, basically military, to help defend itself. But there is no formal commitment to the defense of Taiwan the way there is to NATO, to Japan, to South Korea. Uh, What President Biden said changed that. It flies in the face of 40 plus years of U.S. policy. But then the Biden administration has now been walking that back. So now we're left wondering what exactly is the level of our commitment. And the Chinese themselves are wondering about what is the level of that commitment. And in the wake of Kabul, which let's be honest, was a fiasco, not a success. the, the combination of military and diplomatic fumbling that's going on here is sending Beijing very, very mixed messages. Well, it certainly seems to be the case, Dean, that there's a lot of ambiguity when the people in charge aren't sure what they would actually do. So in a sense, that's what continues on here, at least with Biden. Thanks so much for being with us. Appreciate the expertise. Always good to see you. Thanks for having me. All right, boxer Floyd Mayweather coming to the defense of NBA star Kyrie Irving over his refusal to submit to the COVID vaccine mandate. We'll have the video for you in tonight's Quick Hits. Right now, I want to take a quick second to talk to you about one of the newest sponsors here on Hold the Line, Fume. Fume is the number one natural way to quit smoking and vaping. Fume is all about creating positive habits. And here's how simple they make it for you. Fume created a natural inhaler that allows your body to receive the amazing benefits from some of the world's best super plants. It's a Canadian-made handcrafted wood inhaler with no electronics. You need to check this out. This company is amazing. Fume also has other areas of support beyond helping you quit smoking. Head to breathefume, F-U-M, breathefume.com slash buck and take their quiz to find out which super plants are best for you. It's quick, easy, and will point you to specific plants and the research behind them for their benefits. When you use code buck at checkout, you'll get 10% off. Breathe in the benefits of the world's super plants today. Don't wait. It's time to quit smoking or vaping. Again, breathefumefum.com slash buck. Quick hits are coming up next. Stay with us. Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot gets a surprising reaction from a union that once endorsed her. And squad member Ilhan Omar finally got what she wanted. At least what we thought. It's time for quick hits. But uh, we're going to start it off with something else right now. Boxer Floyd Mayweather, he is a very famous athlete, very, very wealthy. He certainly thinks he's the greatest pound for pound of all time. And he is yet another voice to come out who one would not necessarily associate with Trump or the right, that's for sure. Although I don't know Floyd Mayweather's politics. But he comes out and defends Kyrie Irving, another individual, very well-known, uh, highly paid athlete, African-American athlete. And Floyd, May- Floyd Mayweather is coming out to defend Kyrie Irving on this issue and even said he is a leader. Play it. America is the land of the free. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and supposedly freedom to choose. Never be controlled by money. I respect you for having some integrity and being your own man. A free mind makes his own choices. An enslaved mind follows the crowd. Stand for something or fall for anything. One man can lead a revolution to stand up and fight for what's right. One choice, one word, one action can change the world. It's crazy how people hate you for being a leader. I hope your actions encourage many others to stand up and say enough is enough. Respect to you, Kyrie. Respect to you, Kyrie. A very prominent, influential voice here from the sports world, Floyd Mayweather, defending Kyrie Irving, like I said, calling him a leader, and doing so with some vehemence and eloquence. Could this result in even more athletes coming out and saying, you know what, we're not okay with the infringement upon individual choice and freedom from these vaccine mandates? Certainly possible. And when people of the stature of Kyrie Irving and Floyd Mayweather in their respective professions, professional athletes, come out and say this, it clears the way for others. 
and we continue to fight back against these mandates all across the country, sometimes successfully, sometimes not so much. We'll have to see how this plays out. Ilhan Omar, member of the squad, she has been calling for the defunding of police for the last 18 months. She said that police are a, you know, a, a problem. I'm not quoting her now here, but she look, she doesn't like the cops. She thinks the cops are racist institutionally or systemically racist or whatever. She was a prominent voice in the Democrat Party for the defund the police insanity. Well, here she is talking about the dysfunctional Minneapolis Police Department because there's been a big spike in violent crime in that city. In fact, they set a record for murders last year. Ilhan Omer says they're just not doing their jobs. What we must also recognize is that the reduction in policing currently in our city and the lawlessness that is happening um, is due to two things. One, the police have chosen to not fulfill their oath of office and to provide the public safety they are owed to the citizens they serve. The Minneapolis Police Department is the most dysfunctional police department in our state and probably in the country. Uh, they have decided not to do their job, she said. Is that what's happening? Or was it the madness that was endorsed by Ilhan Omar, among others, of trying to essentially get rid of the Minneapolis Police Department in its entirety? To act like the actions of one officer in the George Floyd incident are somehow indicative of all police officers in Minneapolis and across the country. Right now, she's saying they're not doing their jobs. That's why we have more violence. But back in June of 2020, Ilhan Omar was running around saying we should dismantle the cancer of police in Minneapolis. Watch. We need to completely dismantle the Minneapolis Police Department. The Minneapolis Police Department is rotten to the root. And so when we dismantle it, we get rid of that cancer and we allow for something beautiful to rise. And that reimagining allows us to figure out what public safety looks like for us. What is it? Reimagine what public safety looks like? Cops stop people from murdering people. They hold people accountable when they do engage in violence against their fellow, uh, fellow human beings. I mean, cops aren't, aren't just this general concept of public safety. There are things they have to do, and sometimes that includes the use of force. Hmm. Another city that has a lot of problems with the crime rise and also just with bad leadership in general, Chicago, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, she was at an annual fundraiser for a union that once endorsed her. And here's how they react to her now when she goes on stage. Well-deserved booze, because Lori Lightfoot is doing a terrible job in Chicago. Everybody knows it. Even some of the people who work for her know it. Even some Democrats in that city are aware of it. She, when it was politically expedient for her, pandered to the left and to the BLM movement, and her city suffered. And law enforcement, as well as other city employees, recognize what is going on here and are not appreciative. Senator Cory Booker was talking to uh, Republican Ben Sass from Nebraska. Here's how that went. I want to be respectful of my colleague, my friend, uh, the senator uh, from the great state of Oklahoma. Ouch. I'm sorry, <laughs> sir. I, forgive me, Omaha. <laughs> Omaha's not a state, brother. I'm sorry. Uh, where are you from, sir? We used to be able to beat Stanford in football, and we will return. <laughs> Chairwoman. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, Corey's not as funny as, as I thought he would be there. Nebraska. It's a state. Yeah. That's it for tonight's Hold the Line. The No Spin News with Bill O'Reilly's up next. Shields high.